Hey everyone, this is Chris from Hurtastic Reviews. Uh, I'm sure you're wondering, why do I have a headset on? Why am I sitting awkwardly, like I'm about to pee? And why do I have, maybe you can see a mic in front of me? The reason for that is, we're doing a live call with my boy, Daniel Epler from Cobwebs. He's the host of this podcast, you might have heard of it. They talk about gothic cinema, among other really great film. And instead of doing a really bummy quality Skype call, I thought we'd do some more high-tech stuff and talk about something he's really passionate about, and that's Kino. Daniel, can you uh, introduce yourself to everyone? I know they know who you are. Yeah, I'm Daniel. Uh, I've been on the channel a few times, so you might have seen me. Um, I'm the host of the Cobwebs podcast, where we talk about gothic movies, but we also just talk about old movies in general. And and we kind of, I try to shake it up as much as we can, because I like all kinds of movies. And that's one of the reasons that I like Kino, is because they put out all kinds of movies. Um, Kino are really big champions of film history and they just preserve movies that no one else is putting out. And I really like that. And, you know, in a time of quarantine and at a time of no new movies coming out, this is a good time for film history. So it's a good time for this video. Dude, get your asses ready because this is part of the Hurtastic <laughs> Reviews mini series. If you've been following, it's our new mini series where we talk about boutique label halls. The last video I did, we talked about arrows during the arrow Academy sale and we talked about Criterions. I know Nathan had a little bit of a chub when he watched that video. He told me himself. But today, <laughs> I had to get my boy, Daniel, who's basically a gatekeeper of Kino of sorts. He's always buying them. He actually has a shelf dedicated to just Kino, which I don't have. Um, but you know what? Serial at Midnight. Let's, let's talk about Heath for one second. Heath did a really great... Uh, Kino Winter Sale, which we'll talk about the Winter Sale. He did a really great video on that that I think motivated a lot of people to buy Kino. I remember being on the toilet and telling Daniel, this is pre-corona, so don't get grossed out. But this is um, where the point where I watched that video and I told Daniel, I was like, I think I'm going to buy Kinos. And I think he was like, I already <laughs> bought Kinos. So basically we both splashed on it and I've been keeping a secret on what I've picked up. And I have a feeling Daniel made some really great pickups with some good insight. Is that right, Daniel? Uh, maybe. You know, I actually decided to jump in on this sale after I watched that Serial <laughs> at Midnight video, too. Um, I do a lot of blind buying with Kino because their sales, they make their movies so cheap. A lot of them are even under $10. So it's just super easy to just take a chance on stuff. And I take a lot of chances. And sometimes I get burned for it. But sometimes I get heavily rewarded. Yes, yeah, so what he means by that is Kino is a boutique label. To me, when you when you when on the hierarchy of boutique labels... Kino isn't up there for me, but as of late, their catalog has grown tremendously this past year, which has really got me kind of stroking my chin a few times. So I think they're trying to climb up the ladder. They're not there as an Aero boutique label yet for me, but they're they're, they're, they're getting up there, you know? They're, they're above like Olive Film and, I don't know, Indicator and Eureka, all those Region Bs. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, Daniel, you're the guest on this show. You're the expert. Why don't you tell the guests what you picked up first during this Kino sale? Okay. Uh, well, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a big fan of Italian horror. And I'm a big fan of the Giallo film. I just like how weird and, and crazy and unusual they are. You know, if you watch a lot of movies, sometimes it's nice to just see movies that are unlike anything else you've ever seen. A lot of Giallos are like that. Um, so I picked up what many consider the origin of the Giallo. You know, there was Bird with a Crystal Plumage from Dario Argento that really popularized the genre. Uh, there was Blood and Black Lace by Mario Bava that really made like the bright colors and the amazing visuals like really popular with it. But before that, there was The Evil Eye, which is also Mario Bava. And this one's in black and white. I think it's the only Giallo ever that's in black and white because <laughs> it was so early. Um, it also includes the Italian, original Italian cut in Italian, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, Ooh. which, you know, there's obvious Hitchcock um, influences in Jalo and obviously in that title. But the American cut is called The Evil Eye. I haven't seen this one yet, um, but I'm really fascinated by Mario Bava. And he, he is a little hit or miss for me. I like I don't always fall in love with his movies, but I'm just so interested in him. And I, I kind of want to own all his movies. And I, I bought quite a few so far. So. Kino did a whole uh, line of the Mario Bava collection. Uh, from Kino, I've also got The Whip in the Body and Black Sabbath, which are really, really good. So I'm hoping this one stands up with those two. So that's my first Dude, pick. Dude, some Bava in here. So Daniel has a cat named Brewster who's a gorehound. This is well established. And he stands Mario Bava. 
I swear to God, he does. That's right. My cat stands him. Yeah. Hardcore. So, Especially, um, what's that one slasher that Mario Bava made? Uh, blood. Uh, kill, baby, kill. No, that's not it. That's like the sort of hammer one. Never mind. It'll come to me. It'll come to me later. <laughs> if you're in the comments right now, call our asses out and tell us what that title is. What's Mario Bava's slasher? I can't remember. <laughs> well, Twitch of the Death Nerve. That's what it's called. I'm twi- I twitching right now. Um, <laughs> so Dana doesn't know what I picked up, but I've kept it a really big secret between him. Like, he doesn't know. Nathan Jones doesn't know. Only my roommate Seth knows. And I'm going to start with the first one because I know it's going to mean a lot to Daniel. What I mean by that Ooh. is he's been marathoning this man's filmography and he absolutely enjoys it. I've only known about this movie because of its iconic cover and because when it was on, when I was like in family video, the cover just always stood out and about the message. I think it's always been really popular. And that is Spike Lee's Jungle Fever. And what is he, like blonde, blue eyed surfer type? Hey, dude. Right? <laughs> She's white. White. Man, you. Hey, well, he's black. If your father ever found out, I don't know. She's Italian. H bomb. From Bensonhurst. Nuclear megaton bomb. Hey, look, this is the 90s. There's nothing wrong with it, you know? The both of you got jungle. With uh, starring uh, Wesley Snipes. Now, this movie came out in 1991. And it is about an interracial couple, Wesley Snipes, with a white woman. And I actually haven't seen this movie before. I know it got a lot of great success when it first came out. I know Wesley Snipes was praised for this. And it's a little bit more raunchy for a a Spike Lee film. Because, I mean, look at the cover. And it's about an interracial couple. But it has a lot to do about the the scrutinizing of the time. Because it's 1991. Just kind of still talking about what it means to be in an interracial relationship. It's accepted, but like how many people are bigots about it? But what I really want to know about this movie is like what got it the praise. And I really want to see the really great cast perform because one, you got Wesley Snipes. The female lead is Annabelle Sikora. Um, yes. Skirora. I have never heard of her actually. Uh, but you also have Samuel L. Jackson, John Totoro, Holly Berry, Tim Robbins, Frank Vincent, Brad Dorf, Anthony Quinn. Uh, just like basically most of the people who are in a lot of early Spike Lee films. So I think this movie is one I am going to be very excited to check out. Um, but yeah, Jungle Fever by Spike Lee was one of my first pickups for this uh, winter sale. Nice. You know, when you said that I've been marathoning a certain man's filmography, my brain immediately went to Nicolas Cage and Howard Hawks. And I was thinking, what Nicolas Cage or Howard Hawks movie is on Kino? And I couldn't think of any, but... Wesley Snipes. I don't think it's fair to say that I've been marathoning his uh, filmography. I've only watched four recently, but all four were great. So I like Wesley Snipes a lot. I think him just in action mode is just some of the best cinema you'll ever see. I don't know if that's an action movie. It's Spike Lee, so probably not, but it sounds like good stuff. There's a different type of action in that movie, I feel like. <laughs> oh, is there? <laughs> uh, Dana, what else did you pick up? Okay, so I picked up, this is one that I have seen so far. I bought this Blu-ray, I popped this Blu-ray in. And you know, I said that the Jalo takes a lot of influence from Hitchcock, so what better than to go to a Hitchcock movie? Uh, it's Lifeboat. There's a piece in here about some people that were adrift on a lifeboat for 80 days. Say, maybe we can beat that record. Heaven forbid. We might even get in a newsreel. Uh, this is a black and white thriller that Hitchcock made. It is a single location thriller. And that single location is a lifeboat. Uh, it's a World War II thriller. It's a bunch of soldiers as well as a uh, army nurse. And then one woman uh, journalist who all like the ship crashes and there's this battle and they all end up on this lifeboat and they try to survive. And the interesting thing about it is there's also a Nazi that's on the boat who survived and came onto the boat and they're like deciding, do we just kill him? Do we try to work with him? And thankfully it doesn't become like a boring, oh, they're different, but they learn to respect each other. Like it goes in more interesting ways. Uh-huh. Um, I don't love this movie simply because it feels like a play. Like it's on a boat, but it feels like a play. And, you know, it's obviously because of the time it was made, it's not filmed on a boat. So, you know, it's mostly green screen. So it really just feels like actors in one location just talking that's fine. Uh, that's just not necessarily the kind of cinema that I gravitate towards. Like I love plays. I love live theater, but I like it live. So I'm not the biggest fan of movies that feel like plays is what I'm trying to say, but the acting is terrific. 
almost entirely actors I've never heard of, except for Henry Hull, who was actually the first werewolf in the Universal Monsters movies in a movie called uh, Werewolf and Lo- Werewolf of London. Oh, so he's the only one I'm familiar with. Uh, everyone else unknowns to me, I didn't know, but they're all really great. And it's a good, tense little thriller. It's just, you know, it's not necessarily... I have a weird thing with Hitchcock. Hitchcock's genius often doesn't jump out to me immediately. Like, I think it only really has three times, and that's Vertigo, Rebecca, and um, North by Northwest. And everything else, I kind of have to warm up to. Um, he's He's not a filmmaker that immediately speaks to me, like, say, Howard Hawks. But, um... But any Hitchcock movie is worth owning and worth watching, so I'm happy to have Lifeboat. Oh, that's interesting because, you know, Hitchcock, he always has so many co- like collections and sets put out on Blu-ray, and I'm always like intimidated mm-hmm. on which one to buy, what's a definitive one, one to get, because I don't know no, very two, much on his filmography. I know a lot of the popular ones, they're on the Criterion as well, but, you know, it just, it's, a, it's such an intimidating filmography just based on distribution. So that's interesting that it's on Kino, too. I'll tell you what's not intimidating about his filmography, though. Most of his movies are fairly short, and they're usually really accessible genres, like just thriller. Like, he doesn't have a lot of, like, just period drama romances, the English patient. Like, that's not what he does. So, if you're just in the mood for a thriller with good actors, you know, Hitchcock movies are usually a good way to go. Oh, sweet. Well, it's something I have to check out, then. Now, Daniel, I'm going to break a little rule on my own show. I'm going to talk about two, because I think you'll thank me for it. Let me guess. I know the rule. You're going to talk about a couple of arrows right now, aren't you? Yeah, the major and the minor did just come in, actually. So there you go. Um, well, Billy, Billy Wilder, he's another one of those guys where his genius jumps out to me immediately. Like, I just click with him right away. Not quite Hitchcock yes. as often, you know? Yes, uh, Billy Wilder, we love him on this channel. I think everyone should love him. Uh, but we're going to talk about one more director. And these are for my two pickups. There are two more Spike Lee films, and that is Clockers. That is Clockers and Crooklyn, son. Sorry, Gray. You sorry, why? Sorry I called your mother a hawk. And you sorry about teasing me about being left back three times, about being on welfare, about me and my brothers having three different fathers. All right, already. I said I was sorry. So the reason I want to talk about both of them right now is what I said, Kino has added a lot of stuff to their catalog recently that really got me excited again and one of the catalogs was a lot of spike lee films so you got jungle fever you got summer of sam you got mo blues you got crooklyn clockers and then you also get uh i think do the right thing got no they, that ended up becoming a uh a, a criterion collection re, re, reprint but um yeah they did a Spike Lee like update on the the collection for Kino, and I thought, you know what? If I I've been wanting to get more into Spike Lee, I have a few of his films already on Blu-ray, so I figured I should get these during that sale. Um, another few is like Ryan Johnson's um, Brick got added on to the Kino. I know Seth really wants to get that. It's another one to shout out. But uh, these two, uh, Clockers and Crooklyn. So I'll talk about Clockers first. It has uh, David uh, Keith David on there, Isaiah Washington. Uh, Clockers is kind of like, um, it's about uh, a murder. It's, it's kind of like this similar premise of do the right thing where it's unjustly uh, killing happens and it's about drug dealing. Um, and, and, and it's it's kind of very sincere and close to Spike Lee from what I've always read because it takes place in Manhattan, I believe, or Brooklyn, excuse me, where he's from. And it's basically just another drama where um, social uh, commentary is very evident um, the reason it's called Clockers is there's a 24-hour drug deal, and it's just about this kid surviving um, before he ends up dead, and then it just kind of gets his neighborhood all um, kind of like all up in arms, and then it's just trying to uncover the truth of what really happened during this drug deal, um, and then trying to get revenge of sorts. It's it's kind of it's gonna be a game a movie I know that has a lot of heavy themes that are uncomfortable sometimes, but I know this is one of his more renowned films from his filmography and i really never knew a way of accessing it so i feel like this is the way to do it also one thing to highlight is martin scorsese actually produced this film too so um i just think this is uh kind of worth your time to check out uh i'll probably do uh uh it's a letterbox review on there um it stars uh harvey keitel and john totoro as well keith david like i said is um is in it as well as a police officer so keith david you know we love him 
And then the next film, Crooklyn, I want to talk about, is more of a heartfelt Spike Lee film. It's kind of more sentimental to his childhood growing up. It stars Spike Lee, of course, is in a lot, and it's in 1994. Spike Lee, he stars in a lot of his films. Um, and it also stars Isaiah Washington, who was also in Clockers. Um, this was just kind of about a family of musicians uh, in the 90s in um, Brooklyn. And they're just kind of like living on the block. And they're just, you know, trying to be independent. And it's just kind of like a, a bunch of small, small stories into a bigger story about this neighborhood. So uh, it just, you know, if it sounds so much more heartwarming than a Spike Lee social commentary film. So I felt like this would be a change of pace. So Crooklyn, Spike Lee joint. Nice. I'm so ashamed. I've never heard of either of those movies. Spike Lee is speaking of marathon filmographies. I need to dive into them because I've only seen like two or three, um, especially like clockers. You said it's got Keith, David, I have Harvey Keitel, John Turturro. Oh my gosh. Like what a cast. Yeah. I really want to see that movie now. Yeah. The thing about Spike Lee, that's really interesting. A lot of his movies feel like, um, like set piece theater moments there's a lot of that in a lot of his films there's like these set pieces where like it feels like you're in a theater watching a stage performance and then the rest of it feels like a movie so sometimes it's very hit or miss for him at least from what i've seen watching some of his films so i would say the ones that i'm talking about are more of his more renowned films so those are probably safer films to dive into first you know i don't nice yeah, so. sounds good so i'll let you talk about two okay well i'll jump into another one um so I've kind of been trying to make an effort lately of paying attention to and giving appreciation to action movie directors. Oh. Cause a lot of times I feel like they don't get enough attention like other directors do because they're not uh, tours. They're just guys who come in and just try to do the best they can to make a story and film a good action scene. Like, uh, but unless you're like John McTiernan, you kind of don't get a lot of recognition. Like I've been trying to give a lot of love to Rennie Harlan lately. Rennie, really Harlan. Like Rennie Harlan. Yeah, that's right. Another guy that I really just try to give a lot of love to because he deserves it is a guy named Peter Himes because he directed, these are not kinos, but he directed a couple of my favorite Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, Sudden Death and Time Cop, which are really, really good. And he directed this movie that I picked up from Kino. It's Running Scared. Well, now you're going to criticize my driving? Well, it's just that you get to do all the dangerous stuff and I get to parallel park. Uh, it's a buddy cop movie with uh, Gregory Hines and Billy Crystal. Ooh. And the thing about this movie is it's it's a total hangout movie and it's so much fun because so ever since Lethal Weapon came out, buddy cop movies are always like they're two guys who are really different and they clash and they got to learn to work together. <laughs> uh, 48 Hours is like that, too, which I think came out in 1982. Um, so quite a bit before Lethal Weapon. But this one isn't like that. These two cops, they're best buds. They love each other. <laughs> they love to hang out. They love to have fun. And you just like to spend time with them. And there's a long extended period in the movie where they just take a vacation to Florida and just party it up and just have fun. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, I'll hang out with Gregory Hines and Billy Crystal in Florida. It seems like a good time. Um, but then it's got solid action. The thing about older action movies from like the 80s and 90s, and this one's the 80s. It's uh, 86. Cool is pretty much regardless of the quality, you're going to get cool action because you're going to get cool stunt work because they have no other choice. They can't do CGI. So they're going to have a car crash. They got to crash a car. You know, if they want to have a guy jump off a building, he's got to jump. There's, there's just no choice. So there's some cool stunts in this movie. It's, it's fun to hang out with. Uh, another cool thing about Peter Himes is his son is directing right now. And he directed the two recent universal soldier sequels, which I watched the most recent one this weekend and it's actually really good. And the action is insane. Um, it's got like old fashioned stunt work action, but um, Peter Himes, he's a, he's a good filmmaker running scared is a really good movie. It's honestly one of my favorite Kino blind buys <laughs> I've picked up so far. Yes. Blind buys that hit the mark. I love that, <laughs> but shout out Renny Harlan. You know, you got me all goosebumped and giddy cause we love Renny Harlan. That's right. Dream Master is my favorite Never in Elm Street sequel. Uh, you got Cliffhanger. You got The Long Kiss Goodnight. You got Die Hard 2, which is like by far the best Die Hard sequel. Randy yes. Harlan's a man. Yes, Die Hard 2 is up there with Die Hard in my opinion. It's pretty freaking sweet. I don't know why people neglect it. Flick Pick calls it out after. Like I think he does not like that movie at all. So 
he just he just follows popular internet opinions. He doesn't he doesn't have his own ideas. Woo! That was mean. <laughs> Should I be calling out this boy right now? <laughs> hey, this is the show where we talk about the flick often. Um, what was the other film you picked up? I talked about two. I feel I feel like you should be able to talk about another one. Okay, cool. Uh, this one won't take long. Um, <laughs> it's the Specialists. It is a. It won't take long because I haven't seen it yet. Oh, okay. uh, it's a Sergio Corbucci spaghetti western. Johnny Holiday e Hood. La sua specialità è la sei colpi. Um, you know, there's there's a great joke in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where they <laughs> name Sergio Corbucci the second best director of Italian westerns. And, you know, anyone who's a giant film nerd like us knows, oh, because Sergio Leone is the first is the top Italian western director. I think Corbucci is my personal favorite. Like Once Upon a Time in the West by Leone. That's the best western of all time. But outside of that, I, I kind of think Corbucci has more of my favorite movies like The Great Silence is an incredible western with Klaus Kinski um Django and Navajo Joe incredible movies so I'm really really excited to watch the specialist because Corbucci westerns he's got my heart he just makes like crazy violent awesome movies and just happens to set them in the old west and I love them so this one actually I didn't realize most spaghetti westerns are dubbed in English you know uh good the bad and the ugly Mm -hmm. Django whatever they're dubbed in English this is uh this is not this is only in uh Italian and French so that's interesting but uh, even so, really, really excited to watch the specialists. And don't forget um, the second, the uh, the other film he directed. It was a, a, a James Bond spy ripoff film called Operazione <laughs> Dinomite. So really check that mm, one out. That was gonna. That's that right. Was, that's that right. Was coming on Arrow Video, unfortunately, though. Dude, did you know that Jake Cahill from Bounty Law is in that? Whoa. That's crazy. <laughs> Jake. That's right. That's right. What a picture. Yeah, well, after he he really screwed up that last season and wasn't able to get much TV work, so he had to go to Italy and make westerns. That's right. Did he make a Nebraska Gym as well? <laughs> That's right, he did. That's right, he did. With Francesca Corbucci, who he later married. Ooh. Now, if people are actually following along to all of this, these are... Not real films, but we pray in hope to whatever God you believe in that these things come into existence. And I think Tarantino should put them out as shorts, at least, please. <laughs> Can I tell you a quick story? Yes, please. Um, so soon before Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out, I listened to uh, the Pure Cinema podcast and they had Quentin Tarantino on to talk about the movie. And he talked about the characters in this movie in so much detail that I thought they were real. <laughs> I literally thought so. I thought Bounty Law was a real show and uh, Jake Cahill was a real thing. And I had to like Google around and I figured out, oh, it's it's not based on true story. I would have known that if I'd seen the movie already. Keep in mind, the movie had not come out yet. Okay. But the level of detail that he came up with to make those characters real, crazy. It, it, like it's unbelievable. You listen to that podcast, you think he's talking about real people. What a picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Daniel, the next movie I'm going to talk about because, boy, did we just talk about him not earlier in the show. I'm talking about a Billy Wilder Kino called One, Two, and Three. Drink, Secretariat. Sit down. Sit down, boys. We have no objection. Cigarettes, cigars? Here, take one of these. Thanks. Hmm. Made in Havana. We have trade agreement with Cuba. They send us cigars, we send them rockets. I haven't seen this movie before, but let me tell you, it stars James Cagney, Horace Butchold. I think that's how I pronounce his name, Horace but- Butchold, Ariane Tracy. And the thing about this movie is it's a Cold War comedy from 1961. Now, for those history buffs, uh, the Cold War started before that. Um, but it's about basically this, uh, what is he? He's he's like a like a soda guy. Like he delivers like soda and stuff like that for like commercial, um, for a commercial group. And uh, he's falling in love with his boss's daughter. And then when he finds out that she's gonna marry this communist, and the boss is gonna come in twenty four hours, this soda guy, he has to transform himself into thinking that he wants to be a better son in law, and he's gonna lose his chance of advancement. So he's gonna try and basically turn into a communist so he could sweep this girl under the rug, if that makes sense. It sounds so insane, but it's a comedy film, and it has a lot to say about communism 
and uh, just like the Cold War with because it takes place in Berlin. So you have the East Wall and the West Wall. And it has James Cagney in it. And, you know, when you think like Yankee Doodle Dandy, um, a few of his like um, bank robber films that were early on, to hear him in a comedy that's kind of like kind of a satire of the time, it sounds very interesting. Um, and yeah, Horace Butchold was in The Magnificent Seven. I haven't seen that film. I know it's a Western that most people have seen. So maybe I'll look into you for some clarification there, Daniel. No, I've seen, I've seen the Magnificent Seven remake. I've seen Seven Samurai. I've seen the episode of The Mandalorian that's riffing on Magnificent Seven, but I haven't seen the original one with uh, Yul Brenner. no. Hmm. But that movie sounds really good. Uh, that's another one that I haven't heard of. Um, you know, it's funny. I recently realized that I've never seen a James Cagney movie, so I just got one from Netflix DVD. Uh, I got White Heat, which is one of his gangster movies. Uh, I wanted to start with Angels with Dirty Faces because I think that was his big breakout, but Netflix DVD doesn't have it. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm excited to start looking at James Cagney. I never have before. He's not the lead of that movie, is he? Because he would have been kind of old by 1961. It seems like it'd be too old for a romantic comedy lead. Uh, no, he is the lead of this film. Oh, okay. Surprising because, like, Angels with Dirty Faces, I think that was his breakout. That was the early 30s. Yeah. So, by 1961 must have been an older man yeah and excuse me i i shouldn't say that james cagney was trying to sweep the girl under his feet her feet i was i was incorrect the son-in-law is a young communist beatnik and james cagney has to change him into a suitable son-in-law or else mac james cagney's character loses a place of advancement so he's doing it to advance his job um that's what it really is sorry i, I if before if anybody says hey he read the synopsis wrong I did read it wrong. You got me. But it's a Billy Wilder comedy flick. How the how the hell am I supposed to miss this you know movie? I have to see it, you know? It's like when a Billy Wilder film that's like really well received and you haven't seen it, you automatically try to see it as soon as you can, you know? It's like Totally. I'm like I'm going to come to your house and steal it. Like no joke. I'm doing that. Yeah. And this will be my first James Cagney film too. The only reason I mentioned his other films is just that's how we, I've known of James Cagney and his work. Um Yeah, you know him as a gangster. Yeah. It's like, you know, Al Pacino or of, of the 30s. Yeah, but I did watch uh, like an adventure in moviegoers on the Criterion channel recently. and Or was it an interview? No, it was an interview after a Criterion movie, uh, Ace in the Hole. Um, it, it was an interview with Billy Wilder. And Billy Wilder said one of his favorite actors to work with was James Cagney. So that was another reason why I wanted to pick this up. Nice. That sounds good. Yeah. So, Daniel, what's your last pick? What's that Kino winter uh, pickup that you made, you made that made Heath really jealous? I got a fifth pick. Um, I watched it. I got rid of it. <gasps> I sold it on eBay. I did not like it. It was my least successful uh, Kino blind buy yet. I got it because, like, I couldn't remember for sure, but I thought they'd, like, talked about it positively on Pure Cinema or something. And it was starring Lee Marvin, uh, G uh, Gene Hackman, and Sissy Spacek which seems good. Yeah. Um, it was called prime cut and from a movie from the seventies and I didn't like it. I found it pretty dull. Um, it's also weird in that like Gene Hackman's like running a really explicit and creepy, like sex slavery ring. And, uh, Lee Marvin rescues one of the girls and it's sissy's basic, uh, two years. I, I looked this up. So I was curious two years before Carrie came out. So she's really young. And then she then decides she's in love with Lee Marvin. And of course, Lee Marvin's an old man and it's weird. And it kind of creeped me out and I found the movie dull and I didn't really like it. So <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, I sold on eBay for a dollar more than I paid for it. So I got to see the movie for free and I got a dollar. Uh, so economics. I <laughs> <laughs> um, it sounds like my copy of the park is mine with Tommy Lee Jones. I haven't sold it yet, but it's a, it's a, Kino blind buy that I paid four ninety five for on Amoba com wasn't really good, but I need to figure out a way to sell it. Um, but the last movie I picked up, and you'll probably roll your eyes and be like, "Of course you picked this up," just based on the uh, the star. Um, but that's a film called Easy Living, starring Ray Milland. Oh, nice. Yeah, I haven't seen this movie before, but it's from Mitchell Leeson, who's a the director of Death Takes a Holiday, Midnight, and Remember the Night. Uh, remember the night I think was that Titanic film that has a criterion release. Um, but it stars Gene Arthur from a foreign affair, Ray Milland. Obviously he's 
one of my all-time favorite actors. Uh, so that's the main reason I picked this movie up. But the other main reason I picked it up is it's a screwball comedy where this girl, um, the working girl, her name is, uh, that's uh, Jean Arthur. She basically is a poor working girl who ends up becoming, um, it, she bumps into like this financial advisor and he starts to basically court her. And everyone thinks like she's a she's his mistress because she's like this poor working girl out of class and such. Um, but then um, she actually is in a romance. She starts to fall in love with this one guy she runs into who is a waiter. That's Ray Milan. And she's basically having to convince Ray Milan that she's not this guy's mistress, even though everyone around him and her is saying she's not in love with you. She's with this really rich guy. And it's just kind of like played for comedy. And it's like a misunderstanding um comedy where you know rex riches such like that but it has ray Milland and it's from 1937 which is quite early on before even his portrayal in the lost weekend from 45 so i'm really interested to see a kind of a young buck ray Milland kind of you know star that's another one I'm not familiar with. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Jean Arthur. I love her work with like Howard Hawks and Frank Capra. Uh, if you remember, she's the lead in Only Angels Have Wings, which is the movie I talked about on a recent Cobwebs episode and recommended. Cobwebs. Um, yeah, so she's great. That movie sounds really good. Dude, these these are really good picks. Do you realize that? You did. You picked well. You did very well. Yeah, you know, Kino, <laughs> I don't love Kino, but Kino must love me apparently. So I'm just kidding. I don't. I don't hate Kino. It's just, you know. They're, they're hit and miss because they just, they preserve film history. So they just put out tons of stuff. Uh, it was Heath Holland put it so well on Serial at Midnight. And I know we just, we, we, we compliment him all the time, but <laughs> that was the least explicit way I could say it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he said that, so every year there's big classics, there's big hits, there's big movies. And then there's just all the other movies. And Kino puts out the other movies that would be forgotten otherwise. And I love that they do that. That's very true. And I like how you put that. Um, it's how Heath Holland put it, oh, to be fair. Heath, <laughs> if you're watching this, comment down below. I'll probably scream like a girl and then brag about it to Daniel. Um, <laughs> but no, I probably would like Kino more if they did spine numbers. If they put spine numbers on those bad boys, I'll probably freaking lose it. <laughs> Dude, spine numbers are dangerous. You know this. I, I do. <laughs> now, I did make two more pickups. I just remembered. But they weren't during the winter sale, which is the reason for this haul miniseries here today. But the two pickups I made were from uh, this guy I buy Blu-rays from in Springfield. Now, if you're in Springfield, stay away. That's my turf. Uh, but he sold me two Kinos for five bucks each. And that's Gator and White Lightning starring Burt Reynolds. I haven't seen those Dude, yet. I got White Lightning right over there. Yeah, and that's the reason I bought it is because you owned it and you told me it, it, it's pretty good from what you've heard. So I'm pretty sure you've seen it though, right? No, I haven't yet. Uh, I'm a big Burt Reynolds boy, which is why I bought it. But I can't believe I still haven't popped it in. So I need to. And I like car racing movies a lot. So yeah. It seems like my animal. Well, I got both and you got one. So we might have to do something and doing a watch party on that or something. So that would be fun to do. Uh, that would be fun. Yeah. So those are our Kino pickups during the winter sale. And Heath, thank you for influencing us to do this episode. We keep talking about you. <laughs> but also like the community keep kept talking about the winter sale. There were so many like Kino winter sale like recommendations and stuff like that that I was like, I gotta hop in on this. So good thing my paycheck was big. Uh, but Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time during your busy schedule of film watching to talk about boutique labels with me it makes me so happy makes me happy too thanks for having me on no problem uh daniel also like you can find him on cobwebs that's cobwebs uh podcast uh daniel you want to talk about that a little bit more how they can find you plug it yeah you can find us really anywhere. We're on iTunes. We're recently on Spotify, uh, which means we're on every podcast platform that I can think of. I haven't found one that we're not on. So you can check us out anywhere or at cobblespodcast.com. Our last episode was Stay at Home Movie Night, where myself, Chris, and Nathan Jones recommended some movies to watch at home. And our upcoming episode, I'll uh, give it a tease, is on an HP Lovecraft adaptation. That's going to be a good time. Ooh. Definitely check that out. He's got a really great podcast. It's really fun. Um, just please check it out. Put it, uh, there'll be clicks around this whole video for it, but yeah. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for coming by, um, and talk about these, uh, these films. <laughs> and honestly, everyone, thank you for checking out this video. I know I'm curious to see how this format works. If it looks great, 
Um, if you like it, comment down below because I'll probably start doing it like this from now on during the quarantine season we have going on. Um, but I recently did a podcast episode with Chris Bowie from Filmstock on the Hurtastic podcast uh, channel, which is on Spotify now. It's been on iTunes. Check it out on our website, uh, the Hurtastic podcast. Uh, yeah, the Hurtastic podcast. Uh, you can email the show down below as well. Um, check out some of our other videos. Like I said, this is part two of our uh, Blue Blu-ray Boutique Label uh, mini haul series. So next time we talk um, about Boutique Labels, I'm going to talk about some Scream and Shout Factory pickups. So maybe some more, um, depending on the shipping on that as well. But like I said, my name is Chris here at Hurtastic Reviews. And remember, if you're not buying Boutique Label Blu-rays, you really don't like cinema. I'll see you next time.